Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today our topic is lab tests you can do specifically for your brain. This is after you've already done your general blood tests, and you've looked at your complete blood chemistry, your CBC, and your biochemistry profile, which is your blood chemistries. They used to be called a SMAC20 a long time ago. Sometimes it's more or less than 20 elements, but it's around 20 elements that are tested. And of course, a spot urine test, which is a medical urine test. So getting into the brain issues. When a person wants to find out what's going on with their brain, there are lots of things they can do. There's a few things you can do in blood, and there's a, several things that you can do in urine, and there's also a bit of hair that can be tested. My favorite for looking at the brain to start with is hair testing, especially in children. I think that hair testing is pretty clearly the best screening. It's not the absolute best tool in the world, but is the best screening tool for heavy metals that are chronically exposed uh, to a person. If you've got a heavy metal exposure that you think is acute or industrial or commercial, or you've got you know, a sudden exposure, you should have a blood test for heavy metals. However, it usually, it usually takes about nine weeks for those to clear up and, and leave your blood and be sequestered in your body tissues. So in our case, we're dealing with people that have, have old and cold cases that have been there for months or years or longer, and they, they don't know what the problem is, they don't know when they were exposed, and they're screening for heavy metal exposure. They're not really sure that they have it, they've got symptoms that could be caused by any number of things, and so they get a hair test to look for toxic heavy metals like cadmium and mercury and lead, and they also can look at the normal minerals. It's a very useful test for, for looking at that. There are limits to it, but it is one of the best tests out there. Sometimes a person can consider doing a chelation push test, which is a different blood test, where they give you a, a drug intravenously that chelates or pulls those heavy metals out of your tissues if they're there, and then they come out of your urine. That test has some risk for people that might have unstable immune systems or autoimmune disease, and so there's a risk-benefit to be weighed if a person wants to decide whether they should do a chelation push test measuring their urine exposure of, of heavy metals using that IV. The other tests uh, series are blood tests for the brain. And there is a, a test called creatine kinase, which is a test that shows up in your blood. And if it's elevated, we can measure the pieces of it called isoenzymes and figure out if the brain one is elevated. If creatine kinase or creatine phosphokinase are elevated, those are two different tests we can do. We can look at how elevated the one for the brain is. There's ones for the heart, there's one for the liver, there's one for the, for the skeletal muscle. We can see if the brain one is elevated and look at things like the exposure to brain inflammation or stroke or even in some cases seizure disorders. There's another blood test called CRP or C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a real irritating molecule that, that circulates around the body and it rises pretty fast and it drops pretty fast. So it's a little different than something we've talked about in the past called erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR. And that one is a little bit more slow to rise and slow to go down. So you've got to be pretty sick to have an ESR elevated, but CRP is more sensitive. It rises and falls really fast, and so it's much more sensitive than ESR. So if your ESR is normal, but your CRP is elevated, you probably have a less severe problem. But it's still inflammation. There's yet another inflammatory marker that disturbs your blood vessels, and it's called homocysteine. Homocysteine can be elevated, and the general lab value is about 15, and we tend to like it to be around the 5 to 7 range. Because if it's elevated, there's a higher risk for damage to the small blood vessels in the brain and in the body. And we don't want to have damage to blood vessels because that, that's the precursor for vascular disease and stroke. The next one is just looking at the comparison between LDL and triglycerides. A lot of people that are trying to lose weight or on a diet or on a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet or a carnivore diet are actively losing weight, their LDL is gonna be high. And that by itself is not a risk factor. But when triglycerides are elevated too, that can be a real problem and a sign of carbohydrate bombing where a person's really got too many carbs and they, and they are not taking care of their, their insulin resistance. So we want to see if LDL is high, we'd like to see a normal triglycerides and a normal GGT. There are also a series of urine tests. And for these, I, I mostly use the Great Plains or Mosaic Laboratory for this, but there's other labs that do it. And now these are not measuring neurotransmitters directly in the urine. These are measuring urine organic acids that are breakdown products of brain neurotransmitters. 
Now, admittedly, these neurotransmitters are not found only in the brain, and they don't give you an exact measure of your neurotransmitters, but they do give you a good idea of what's going on. And so these are things like vanillomandelic acid and homovanillic acid and, and DOPAC and HPHPA. These are different molecules that measure neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin and epinephrine and a little bit of estrogen break down in your body. And you can measure these in your urine. So they can give you an idea of how your brain is doing. Oxalates are something I've talked about before and oxalates affect the brain specifically. Now I've talked about ox oxalates in the body regarding joint pain and all kinds of stuff, but generally oxalates don't just cause kidney disease and joint pain, they can lead to ADHD and contribute to ADHD because the crystals can form in the brain. This is not a lot of fun, and it can also form pseudo-gout, which is a gout-like condition that really looks like gout, but it's not. It's oxalates instead of uric acid. Another lab test you can do that's urine-based is a test for organic acids. And organic acids generally is just a panel of tests that look at a bunch of stuff that include your neurotransmitter ones that I talked about, as well as mitochondrial testing of several types, the oxalate test that I talked about, and it would include tests for a dysbiosis. It turns out that if you're trying to look for candida, for example, candida is better measured in your urine than in your stool because t candida tends not to come out in stool, even though it lives in your intestine. So it's, it's better to measure that in the urine. So you get a good measurement of dysbiosis and bad gut bacteria and fungi that might be living inside you. The brain is highly sensitive to glyphosate and it's highly sensitive to mold. So you can also get panels that measure your mold levels and that measure your, your glyphosate levels. Re realize that this is not antibodies to mold. This is the actual mold toxin burden that's in your body coming out in the urine. So that is our measurement of blood tests, urine tests, and hair tests that you can do specifically for your brain.